hard. People give up. The suicide rate has gone up this year and last year because of the pandemic. It's out of control. Uh, but what people don't understand is life is hard for everybody. You guys are young. You guys have, haven't really experienced all of the hard things in life yet. But if you live long enough, you will. Life is going to be very difficult if you don't make good decisions. But even if you do everything perfect, you still could face some struggles. You still could face some problems and you're still going to have to deal with things that everybody has to deal with. It's not going to be unique to you because everybody has problems. Your problem might be unique, but just the fact that you have problems and struggles and trauma in your life, those things are not unique to everybody. Everybody's going to go through hard times. But the problem I'm having today is everybody think they have a solution. Since tragedy visits everyone and we all have trauma to live with, the remedies of life's struggles are found only in the word. Today, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 15, 51, verse 54. I need y'all help just with this scripture. If y'all can read this with me. Behold, I show you a mystery. This means all be changed. Okay, this means that this, I'm going to show you something that nobody else knows, that nobody else have talked about, talked about. This is not ever written anywhere else in the Bible. It's the first time you're going to hear this. This is a mystery. It's a secret. Like everything in the Bible is a mystery and it's shrouded in mystery. I'm going to tell you a secret. We shall not all be dead. That's what it means, sleep. We're not all going to stay dead, but we're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, how fast does your eye twinkle? Super fast. We're going to be changed when the last trumpet sounds. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. Dead people are going to get up out of the grave. They're going to get up incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So what this scripture is talking about is one day, Everybody that's dead, everybody that's dead in Christ, everybody that has been saved, everybody who's been baptized in Jesus name, everybody who's been filled with the Holy Ghost, all of those people, even though you die, you're going to get up and you're going to get a brand new body. So I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm just giving you the fact that everybody has struggles. Everybody has problems. Everybody thinks they have the solution. There's only two things to know to deal with life. Two things. Life gets hard, but there's only two things that you need to know. That's not working. Nothing else matters for the saints, but the two things I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to introduce you to my character today, Mr. Job. Anybody know about Job? Y'all know about Job's story? Job had everything that he wanted, and he got everything the right way. He didn't lie, cheat, or steal. He didn't sell drugs on the street corner. He didn't do anything wrong. Job did everything that he was supposed to do. God blessed him. He got all of his stuff from God. He was blessed by God. He had his college degree. He had his house with the fence and the dog, and he had the perfect lawn. He had the car of his dreams, whatever car that is. Um, and he had money in his pocket. Do you need to remember? Hi, Jennifer. He, he had a plenty of money in his pocket, but what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? If he loses his own soul, all of the stuff that you can get in this world means nothing if your soul isn't saved. What is the equivalent of these items that Job had? In Job um, 1 verse 3, we see that Job was a perfect upright man. He did everything right. Job didn't sin. He wasn't a bad guy. He did everything right. And here are the things that he had. He had 7,000 sheep. And I know this doesn't mean anything, but I'm going to try to give you the equivalent of what those things are today. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel. 500 yoke of oxen. He had 500 ox. That's a lot of ox tail. He had uh, 500 female donkeys. He had a, a very great household. This was a, and this was so that this man was the greatest of all of the men that lived in that area. So, what would be the equivalent of if all of your ox? I think he said had 500 ox. What would be the equivalent of all your ox? got stolen. That would be the equivalent of you losing your job. So 
if all of your servants got murdered, that would be the equivalent. This is what the Bible says happened to him. That would be the equivalent of all of your friends being murdered. If all of your sheep got struck by lightning and burned alive, that would be the equivalent of you losing all of your clothes in your house. If all of your camels got stolen, that would be the equivalent of all of your cars being destroyed. This is not working for me. I don't know why it's deciding to do this now. God help me. Lucy or devil. So this is exactly what happened. All of Job's ox got stolen. Somebody came and they stole all of his ox. What did I say the equivalent of his ox was? That was the equivalent of him losing his job. Somebody took all of the money that he had out of his bank account and he got fired from his job for whatever reason. All of his employees, because Job was a businessman, all of his employees were murdered. However you want, however you want to put in your mind that that happened. And then all of his cars, camels, were stolen. All of his camels, all of his ox, everything that he had was stolen. Then, you, if this wasn't in the Bible, you'd think it's a fairy tale. Lightning struck his sheep and caught him on fire. What is the equivalent of the sheep? That's all of your clothes and all of your worldly possessions and all of your things being burned. Then, after that, all of his kids, Job had 10 kids. All of his kids were at the house eating dinner. Now this, the part, this is the part that most preachers talk about, but they don't go into detail. All of these things happened all at once. I'm not going to go the way the traditional preachers go today because we've heard that message, but they leave out a lot of stuff. And that's what I want to talk to y'all about today. All of the Job's kids were eating. Somebody had came in the house and told him, dude, they just, you just lost your job. And as soon as he said that, somebody else came in the house and said, hey, all of your employees just got murdered. And as soon as he said that, somebody else came in the house and said, dude, all of your cars just got destroyed. And all of these things are happening all at once. And then somebody comes in the house and said, Joe, there was a tornado. And it fell on the house where your kids were. And all of your kids are dead. All 10 of them. All of them. The worst part about that is God allowed it. What do you do? When the devil is on your tracks, when the devil is trying to destroy you, what do you do when everything that's happening to you is the devil? You can turn to the saints, you can turn to God, you can turn to the church, but what do you do when God is the one that's doing it to you? Well, who do you turn to? See, with the devil, you can turn to God. With God, you can turn to nobody. It's it. It's final. What would be your prayer if this happened to you? If God destroyed everything that you got you got to go live under viaduct your house is gone your kids is gone your your livelihood is gone your money is gone and you you didn't do anything wrong job didn't do anything wrong in addition to that this wicked evil devil went back and said hey i need to do one more thing i need to do one more thing to him i'm going to put these boils these pus bumps all over his body the bible says he smote job with sore boils from the sole of his foot until the crown of his head he had these things all over his body, from the bottom of his foot, all over his body, to the top of his head. And it got so bad, you know what he did? He took a pot, a planted pot, broke the planted pot, and used the broken pieces from the planted pot and scraped the pus bumps off of his body. That's the only way to deal with it. And these were all over his body. Does it show him? It's actually nothing else. What do you do when life is over, overwhelming? What do you do when you can't take it anymore? What do you do when life is just, there's so many things that's going on. What do you do when your loved ones have died, when your friends have walked out on you, when your job has fired you, when there's nothing, no one to turn to? They'll tell you, and motivational speakers, preachers these days, they'll tell you all of the steps the 10 steps to a turnaround, the five steps from grief. You go through grief and denial and anger and bargaining, then depression. But what do you do when none of those words work? The only thing you can do is turn to the word. Delete all of those audiobooks. Forget about all of those motivational speakers. There's only one solution. Remember, I told y'all there's two things that you have to do. But what do you do when you have gone through bankruptcy, inflation, unemployment, 
all of your money is gone. You've done absolutely nothing wrong. And you feel like God doesn't hear you. Who said that it's not okay to quit? See, this is what people won't talk about. They don't want to get real. They don't want you to feel like you should have emotions, especially men. They don't want men to feel like it's okay to be vulnerable, to cry, to feel like you have pain. They don't want you to know that you can feel like giving up. You can feel like it's okay. As long as you don't do it, it it's okay to feel like you just want to quit. There are some traumas. There are some things in life that will come and it will make you feel like I can't go any further. You probably don't know this, but they lost a little brother before they was even born. We got to see him laying in the hospital room, lifeless, dead. The worst day of anybody's life. We didn't do anything wrong. We did everything that we were supposed to do. The pain is unbearable. If you lose a mother, a father, or aunt, that's natural. We're going to die one day. That's natural. Your parents are going to die one day. That's the way it's supposed to go. But it's so unnatural for a parent to have to bury their own child. It's not right. That pain will never go. We will suffer with that every single day. The day, the anniversary, it couldn't have happened on a worse day when we have family here and it's Thanksgiving and everybody's happy. That, that Thanksgiving, thank God for what? That's the day that God decides to give us the worst trauma in our life. Every Thanksgiving that comes around, the grief, the pain becomes unbearable for the both of us. And we don't even have the words to try to encourage each other. We, we just don't know what to do. That's a real feeling. But what people are trying to tell you is ignore that. Look up. They'll give you all type of words that, that, that means absolutely nothing. And we truly, sometimes you just feel like we want to give up. But I want to encourage you. I want to encourage everybody listening. Your next life is permanent. You're living to live again. This ain't it. There's something that happens after this life. So don't worry about hard times. Don't worry about heartaches, this depression, anxiety, desperation, despair. Keep in mind that the Lord is coming back one day and one bright morning soon. What do you do when you can turn when you turn to your friends and your friends can't help you? Which one of the situations Job went through, his friends could have taken it away. Can he bring his kids back? Can he bring his family back? Can they bring, can they give him back his money? Can they re repair the house that was destroyed? What do you do when you have misery and no company? We know misery loves company, but what do you do when there is no company? What do you do when there's nothing? You guys just live a little while and you'll see life gets tough. A man's life is but a few days, but it's full of misery. But I'm so glad that this life is temporary. This is messing up again. This life is temporary. You're living to live again. The Bible says all of Job's friends came. They came. They showed up. But what does Job 2.13 say? So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days, seven nights, and none of them spoke a single word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. His friends came. They came crying. They can't fix your problem. It's nice that they're there, but they can't, they can't even say a word. I almost like that better because every time somebody says something, they think they're going to fix the problem. And sometimes people just need to shut up. What happens when you even call on your friends, when you call on your mom, when you call on your family and they don't have a solution when there is no solution? God did this. This is God level stuff. And there probably is no way to fix it. People say stupid stuff, especially at funerals. Oh, heaven has gained another, another person today. My kid died. How are you going to fix that? There's only one set of words in the Bible. The Bible requires one set of words to comfort someone during the worst times of their life. Oh, time will heal all wounds. How does that fix my kid being dead? How does that fix the trauma that I've gone through? How does that fix the things, the unhorrible things that happened in my childhood? Your words can't help me. What happens when the, the words of comfort don't bring comfort? when it just stresses you out, when there's nothing you can do to fix any of your problems, there's nothing, you, you can turn at people if you want to, you can go to them and cry to them all you want and they can't fix it. What do you do then? You go to the church, you go to the preacher, he gives you some words of encouragement and he send you home. He might even give you some scriptures, but it doesn't bring my child back. 
It doesn't bring my job back. It doesn't get me back into my house that's destroyed. It doesn't move me from living under the vida. What am I gonna do now? Job verse three. I don't know why this is not working. I can barely see this. I'm sorry, y'all. Can you please, after this, open Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, let the day perish wherein I was born and the night in which it was said, there was a man child conceived. Let so Job is saying, the day that I was born, I want that day to be destroyed. Job is so mad that he is, I mean, is he, does he have a right to be mad? Yeah. God took everything from him, his camel, his ox, his kid, his house. Job is saying, I want the day that I was born to be destroyed. The day that I was conceived, the day that my mother and my father made me, I want that day to be destroyed. What is verse four? Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let oh, it Job is complaining. Uh -huh. To the days of the year. Job can't take it no more. What's verse, uh, uh, chapter three, verse seven? Lo, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful noise come therein. Let them curse it that curse the day are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let it be looked for light, but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day. Because it shut not up the doors of my mother's womb. Nobody talk about this, Job. Nobody, all people say when they talk about Job is, Job had all of these problems. And all of the people came in the house and they told him what happened. And then Job said, let the Lord give it, the Lord take it away. How about this? This dude lost it. He's tripping. He's going through some stuff and it's okay. I'm saying it's okay. Other people will tell you, no, don't do that. I want you to be real. Here's the, here's the, here's the part that really gets me. What does verse 11 say? Why died I not from the womb? Why didn't I die in my mother's stomach? He continues. Why didn't I die when I came out? I wanted to die in my mother's womb. I never wanted to live. Wait a minute, Joe, you had a good life. You had cars, you had money. You had kids. What about that? You don't want that. There's a pain that comes that can erase all of your happiness. There's a pain that can come. There's a trauma that can come. There's some bad things that can happen in your life. And you'll forget all about the good days. You forget about all the stuff that happened. And that's dangerous. You need to start focusing. You need to start focusing on all the good days that you've had before. If you had a bad childhood, start thinking about the times after that, before that. Think about something else. Think about today. Think about your future. Think about tomorrow. Nobody wants to deal with that, but I want you to be real. Life gets hard. And you do sometimes feel like giving up. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. They say, this is what they tell you. They'll tell you, don't question God. This is why they say that. Because what happened after Job said all of this? You know what happened? God got mad. He came down in a whirlwind. The Bible said he just showed up in a tornado. And he started telling Job off. And that's why people say, don't ask God any questions. But I think you should ask God a question. Because look what happened. God showed up. If God's going to show up by me asking a question, that's fine. If you took everything away from me, God, but at least you should come right here, God. You ever drive down the street and you just say, God, sit right here. I just want to hear your voice. Speak through the radio. Let somebody call me and encourage me. Let me open the Bible. Speak to me the Bible. Just come by me, God. Come close to me, Jesus. If I'm sitting on the couch at night, God, just sit right here. Sit next to me. And if I have to question you, God, if I have to get upset, if I have to reach my, my last nerve, if I can't take it anymore, if I get to the point of suicide, if you show up, I'll do whatever it takes. Because I know once God show up, he's going to come with an answer. At least he's hearing me, even if he doesn't fix it. If he doesn't give me my kids back, at least he heard my cry. At least he's seen my pillow full of tears. At least he heard my footsteps all night when I can't sleep and I'm worried about this and I'm stressed about that and anxiety is taking over and depression is weighing on me. At least he heard me. And at least he showed up. Here's, 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 here's that one thing I told you. Here it is. And I'm done. Here's that one thing I told you. I can't read this either. It's just I cannot. Here's what you have to do. When you're going through the worst time in your life, this is a message directly for you. When you're going through the hardest time in your life, when things are out of control and you absolutely can't make it, the Bible says this is the only thing you need. Nothing else will comfort you. First Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. God's not sending an angel. The Bible says God is coming himself. 
He's coming himself with what? A shout. With the voice of He's going to shout your name. He's going to call. Time I to call you. My he can't he's calling for you. And he's coming himself. He ain't sending nobody. He ain't sending no messenger. God is coming himself. What else? With the trump of God. And even if you're dead, the Bible says God is so powerful. When he called your name, the grave doesn't have the power to hold you. The dirt ain't deep enough. The coffin ain't strong enough. Your body will, the, the, the worms that ate the skin will have to vomit it back up. The skin will have to come back on your bones. Your hair will have to come back on your head. You're going to have the power and the strength to stand up out of the grave. What else? Um, then we which are alive and remain shall be called. If you're not alive. dead, the Bible says you're going to, wherever you are, whether you're driving in a car, whether you're on the airplane, you're going to call, catch up with those same people and you're going to meet God right in the clouds. Whatever you're going through, what different does it make now? Whatever pain you have, what different does it make now? If you're not saved, I'm so sorry for you because this is a great coronation for the saints only. I'm sorry if you miss it. If you miss it, it will be hell to pay. Tribulation is coming. Hard times are coming. When the saints ain't here, I'm not sure what you're going to do. When there's no church, when there's no prayer, when there's no Holy Ghost on this planet, I don't want to be here. I don't want to miss this because it happens one time. I want to get my life right now. While the blood is running warm in your veins, this is the time to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me for everything because it don't matter anymore. All of the stuff that I want to hold on to, all of the things that I want to do, all of the things where my flesh leads me to, all of the desires, the proclivities, all of the things that's inside of me, take it away, God, and make me just like you. Make me ready for when you return, God. So when I hear your voice, when I hear the trumpet, God, give me the power, God, so I'll get up out of this grave. Give me the power, God, so I get up off of this planet where gravity won't matter where none of the things and none of the nature none of the natural things will matter. God will just call your name and you have no choice because of the power of the Holy Ghost. You'll just connect with him and you'll be in the sky in a twinkling of an eye. God's going to show up quick and he's going to grab us and he's going to get out of here quick. And the best part about it is when you get past those clouds, if this, if you think about this, all of the other press, you're not thinking about Job no more. You're not thinking about your problems no more. Once you get past the, once I get past the clouds, I'll know him when I see him. I'll know it's him. You don't have to tell me that's God over there. I'll know it's him. And when I see him, I'm going to wrap my arms around his neck. I know you're standing in line and I know you're next. This is the type of stuff you have to think about. I know you want to get your turn, but I'm never going to let him go. It'll be a thousand years and I'm still holding on to him. This is the man that died for me. This is the man that, that, that raised, me, raised me from the dead if I'm dead. This is the man who raised me off the ground if I'm alive. This is the man that got me out of my sins. This is the man who healed my body. If you're going through hard times, hardships, calamity, and despair, these are the words that will comfort you. What is verse number uh, 17 says? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and, and remain, remain shall, remain, shall be, be caught up together, together with them in the cloud to, to meet, meet the, the Lord, Lord in the air. air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's it. No more heartache. No more crying. I'm going to a place where the wicked shall cease from troubling. I'm going to a place where the weary shall be at rest. I'm going to a place where there's no more sickness. There's no more lying. There's no more death. There's no more trying to be saved. I made it. I'm beyond the clouds. This is it. And verse number 18 tells you why I even said this. What is verse 18 says? Because of this, Comfort one another with these words. Not your motivational speaker. Not your audiobook. If somebody's going through hard times, comfort them with these words. If you having a hard time, if you can't deal with the trauma of your life, if you can't deal with whatever you're going through, whatever pain it comes that comes, comfort yourself with these words. These are the only words that the Bible gives to comfort you. You can be comforted knowing that God is coming back and he's coming back for me. He's not sending an angel. He's going to call my name. And when he gets here, when he gets here, one bright morning, when this life is over, I know it hurts, but one bright morning, when this life is over, I'm going to fly away. I'm going to take the wings of the morning. And I'm going to soar to be with God. 
All of the problems won't matter anymore. Nothing will matter anymore. That's the one that died for me. That's the one that set me free. That's the one that delivered me. I told you that's the one that healed me. When I see his face, I'll know that's my kinsman redeemer. I'll know that's my master. I'll know that's my savior. I'll know he's the king of kings. I'll know he's the Lord of lords. And you won't have to tell me that's Jesus over there. There's one more thing that I told you. I told you it was two things. There's one more thing that Job did to comfort yourself knowing that God is coming back because what else matters? There's one other thing to do. Verse number one, Job arose after he heard all of these things and after all of these things happened. Job tore his clothes, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and he did the only thing that we should be doing besides comforting ourselves with those words. God is coming back and I'm going to worship him. Nothing else matters. Fly away to that home on God's celestial shore. I fly away. You know that I fly away. Oh, glory. I fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. I fly away.